Hey, Patrick from Crafted Fractal here. Welcome to my basement lair. Uh, today I want to tell you about how I made this wooden mallet. Uh, first things first, I'm not an expert. I built this based on Rex Kruger's wood plans uh, and tutorial video for the advanced joiners mallet. He's the real pro, so go check out his tutorial video and woodworking plans to get the official word on how to make Thor's hammer. I mean, Mjolnir. I mean, a joiner's mallet. If you want to learn from my experience and watch me find creative solutions to all the mistakes I made along the way, then here we go. So my friend Miles suggested we both make the same mallet at a distance. Me in New York, them in Boston. I looked at the current cheapo wooden mallet I had. I decided this was a great idea. So I started with a log of Osage orange firewood. Mistake number one. I now know that professional lumber is dried in a particular way. Professionals measure how much moisture is inside the wood, and they typically season the wood until it reaches roughly 10% moisture content, meaning either it's kiln dried or it sits in a dry environment for one to two years before it can be used. If it's seasoned without a kiln, typically the section of tree has its ends sealed. Since a log is basically a bundle of straws, stopping at both ends of the straws means that the water escapes through the sapwood and the bark of the tree. This ensures that all parts of the wood dry at roughly the same rate. I can show you if you don't seal the wood. All right, I actually have already added a little bit of something to these, but if you don't seal the wood, then each end of the straws are leaking out moisture and the ends dry faster than the center. So they shrink while the center stays more stable and you get cracks in the wood. Known as checks in the industry. Firewood is seasoned, but since it's going to be set on fire, there's no real reason to seal up the ends. So checking, splitting and warping, it's really common. But I hadn't learned this yet, so I thought this piece of wood was pretty and I just started hacking off the sap wood as Rex recommends. I got a pretty solid center, and when I sawed off one of the ends, it looked like the cracks in the wood actually weren't as bad as they originally appeared. So I milled the sides off into a roughly rectangular prism. I posted on Instagram asking how much of a knot in the wood I could get away with. To my dismay, Rex Kruger himself commented, that's too much. I thought about starting over from scratch. I looked through wood that I might use if I did, and then I decided, what the heck? I'm probably going to mess it up my first time anyway. I'll just keep going as an experiment and it'll be a learning experience. Speaking of which, here we'll take a slight detour into a discussion of the, the importance, importance of, of stability, stability when, when sawing, sawing wood. wood. You see, I use almost exclusively hand tools. I just don't really like the noise of power tools and I like knowing how something would have been made 500 years ago. I haven't released a video for it yet, but in the fall I built a puzzle box. I've been using the same Japanese pull saw since then, a ryoba made by blacksmith Master Ikeda and Master Yoshikawa. At that time, all I had were plastic trigger clamps that I attached to a portable plastic workbench. Needless to say, I do not recommend this method. Since none of the elements in the process were actually stable, every time I moved the saw, it was also moving the wood and even the table. So regardless of any kung fu prowess I might possess, it was literally impossible to make a clean cut this way. But my friend Blair was kind enough to gift me a bench vise that she wasn't using. And as Robert Frost would say, that has made all the difference. I'm still in need of a proper workbench, but I drilled the vise into a slab of wood and weighted the wood down and it's actually not half bad. Less effort, cleaner cuts, joy, joy, joy. I cut the length and width for the handle of my mallet. I finally was able to use both hands on my bench plane because I wasn't worried about the wood slipping out of place, which meant I could get thin, beautiful ribbons. I planed down to get flat sides that are relatively square. I actually am still in the process of making winding sticks and haven't fully learned how to get proper square sides. So this was not a perfect process, but I got very close. Oh, also, I got a fancy new photo light box during this time. I used my whittling knife to rough out the curve of the handle. I love this detail knife from Helvi. 
With the limited supply, they're hard to get a hold of, but my dad was able to track one down for my birthday last year. Then I sand it down to smooth things out, first with 80 grit, then 220 grit sandpaper. Cleaned it up a bit with wood cleaner, then I cut the top into the double tapered mortise that makes the mallet so rock solid. I found the center of the mallet head and used the handle as a guide for how large to cut the tenon, thinner at the top and wider at the bottom. You'll notice that the knot in the wood is close to the center of the head. Aside from giving me a jump start on boring out a hole, I knew this was going to make precision very difficult to achieve. Still, onwards I went. I bored out a hole in the center and then began chiseling slowly, layer by layer, until I had a rectangular tenon through to the other side. The center I had measured wasn't really the center, probably because I was biased toward going through the knot hole. So keeping the seven degree angle, I cut a bit more off of one side. Testing the handle and the mallet head, it seemed like this thing might actually work. I chiseled the bottom of the head into an arc and then filed down to smooth things out. I made roughly the same arc on the top of the head. Finally, there was nothing to it but to do it. I sawed a slit in the tenon on top of the handle, glued up the sides, shoved it into the mallet head, and wedged a bit of scrap wood into the top. I ended up wedging a bit of additional scrap wood to cover the gaps from my imperfect joinery. I sawed off the top, cleaned off the extra glue that was dripping through the joint. I snuck a bit of glue into the cracks of the mallet head as well, mixing some sawdust in to strengthen it and better match the color. I sanded everything down, put some mineral oil on it, added some homemade beeswax polish, and voila, a handmade joiner's mallet. In the end, I love the gnarly knot and grain of the wood on the bottom. I've done a couple projects using this mallet now and it's working great. I'll keep you all posted, you know, maybe it'll shatter a month from now. Uh, but again, that'll be a learning experience. And in the meantime, it's much better than the mallet I had before. Huge thanks to Miles, who inspired this whole project and was an amazing accountability buddy. Your mallet is awesome and much more professional. Thank you as a Rex Kruger for documenting your process in recreating a traditional joiner's mallet. You are keeping the practice of woodworking alive and thriving, and it's truly really a beautiful thing. Do you have a favorite wooden mallet for woodworking? Have you tried making Thor's hammer? Let me know in the comments. If you liked the video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, follow at Crafted Fractal on Instagram and TikTok, and I'll see you next time.